Hello, this is Blake from UK Entomology, and this is a presentation in support of the Kentucky Keepers Program. So this is our 4-H Invasive Species Education and Monitoring Program. Um, so there's a series of these, and if you do a certain number of them, you can get uh, certified as an invasive species educator, or you can just tune in to learn more about invasive species or learn how to monitor for them. So these uh, presentations are meant to serve a couple of different purposes. But today we're talking specifically about the spongy moth, which is one of our species that Kentucky keepers can help us with um, in terms of both educating folks and monitoring. So once again, the goal of the Kentucky keepers program is for 4-H staff and also 4-Hers to learn about invasive species and also monitor some specific invasive species that currently threaten Kentucky's borders. This is just a reminder, we've gone over this, we'll probably go over this a little bit in all of these presentations, but just to remember some things that invasive species have in common. Um, they're always going to be new to an area. They're always gonna be from someplace else, usually from another continent. A lot of times they can breed or spread really fast. They either lay a whole bunch of eggs or if they're something like kudzu, they can grow really fast. They take resources or kill local plants and animals. Things like kudzu steal sunlight from other plants. Things like house cats kill um, songbirds and native rodents. And often these invasive species have no or few local enemies that will kill and eat them. So an invasive species is an organism that causes ecological or economic harm in a new environment where it's not native. I look a little different on this slide because this is an update. We've had to change this slide um, based on some new information. So what this image shows is a reminder, and we show this on most of these presentations for Kentucky Keepers, that Kentucky is a place where a lot of invasive species are kind of converging all at once. As you can see there, the creatures with a yellow arrow are ones that are already in the state, and ones with an orange arrow are things that are not quite here yet. We've had to change this because um, spotted lanternfly is now in Kentucky as of around summer and fall of 2023. It's been found in the northern Kentucky area, and it may be in even more places than that by the time you see this. So it is a present invasive species, but we still want to study it for um, Kentucky keepers. Uh, but as you can see there, there are several creatures coming to us at once from all different directions. This particular presentation is going to be about spongy moth which comes to us from the Northeast. It is very well established in some of those places. And we get a few of them in Kentucky every now and then, but we don't seem to have breeding populations. And that's what we want Kentucky keepers to help uh, to, to keep from happening. So what is this spongy moth and why is it a problem? So spongy moth, you see a picture of it there. It's just kind of a average sized moth um, you see the, the male is darker, the female is lighter, and um, the, uh, the female is maybe an inch or so long with her wings, the length of her wings there, and the male is a little bit shorter than that. These creatures were not native to the United States. They're native to Europe, and they were brought to the United States on purpose to New England in the late 1800s uh, because they, they have in their, their cocoons, they have, they've produce a silk on their cocoons that's a little bit like the true silk moth. And so there was an idea that you could harvest this stuff. Well, it didn't work, but the creatures got loose and started breeding out in the wild. And within the decades, so even before the dawn of the 1900s, it was already a problem in the Northeast and the, the New England area, and it's been spreading ever since. So these ca the caterpillar stage of the moth is the part that actually does the damage. Adult moths of any kind, whether it's spongy moth or any other kind of moth, adult moths don't feed on anything, uh, anything solid. Um, so whenever you hear people talking about clothes moths eating your sweaters, it's the baby, it's the caterpillar stage that does that, not the moth. Moths can only drink nectar if they can eat anything at all. But, but same thing is true with spongy moth. The spongy moth caterpillar feeds on the leaves of many kinds of trees and oak is a particular problem. Um, when these things get to very high numbers, they massively defoliate trees like oak trees in places where there are a lot of oak trees, so oak forests. It doesn't kill the tree right away. A tree can survive losing all of its leaves if it just happens once. 
But if it happens over and over again every year, eventually the trees decline and they die. And of course, new baby trees that are trying to go grow leaves have a big problem as well. Um, few predators will attack the spongy moth. So most of the things that would attack spongy moth are things that are adapted to it to attack it. Certain uh, certain birds, certain insects, but we don't have those creatures here. And um, our local predators uh, don't like it for a variety of reasons. They just aren't adapted to look for it. And also, uh, in the caterpillar stage, they're covered with nasty hair. Um, that makes them unpalatable to most creatures. Actually, a lot of caterpillars have hair like that, but these guys definitely have that. And also, when the female lays eggs, she puts a gunk over them that protects them from most predators. So both the caterpillar stage and the egg stage have a protection, and in the adult stage, just not many things are adapted to try to find it, to try to eat it. And so now it is spread all over the Northeast, and once again, it used to be called the gypsy moth, but we have changed its name to the spongy moth because the, the egg coating is kind of a spongy, a spongy kind of thing. So this is a map, a quarantine map. So this creature has been um, quarantined by the federal government, which means places that have known breeding populations of the spongy moth, if you want to import or export uh, lumber from those areas, you have to take some steps, uh, fill out some permits and that kind of thing. It makes it a big headache if you're trying to export lumber from your state to some other state. But this kind of gives you an idea of where the spongy moth was up until uh, this, this map goes up to around 2006, and we'll show you a newer one of these in a little while. But the um, the red areas is all quarantined. So that, those are the places where spongy moth is pretty much totally established and um, uh, spreading and breeding. And then outside of that, you can see where in, in, the, um, uh, in some of these brown, some of the orange, some of the blue, these are places where they're I mean, partial quarantine or certain counties are quarantined. And as you can see, Kentucky um, is basically outside of that. We're not in the quarantine zone, which means that we have no known populations of spongy moth breeding and living in our state but as you can see we are also very close to them and also this map is almost 20 years old and some of these are, some of these counties have crept a little closer which we'll see in a little bit but this does give you an idea of kind of the traditional spread of the spongy moth over the years a little bit about the impacts of this creature it has big economic impacts there by the way is a picture of the caterpillar it's kind of a pretty caterpillar with almost some blue and some red spots on it but you can see the hairs that cover it um, most birds and things just don't like to eat caterpillars that have all these nasty hairs the hairs are kind of sharp um, they can break off inside the uh, the creature's um, throats uh, they're hard to digest and so forth um, but the big impact of it, especially in a place like Kentucky, is that oak is considered our predominant species, in a, our, our predominant forest tree species in a big part of our state. Um, so we don't want a creature here that feasts on our, our main trees. And in some areas where you have a big spongy moth presence, 50 to 90% of the forest can be killed in some places when you have a really bad outbreak. So that would be a, that would be a big deal. Young trees in particular also have a really hard time getting established because as they're trying to grow, they only have a few leaves when they're little. And if all those get defoliated, it's going to be really hard for them to grow down there in the understory or they're having a hard time getting any sun. Anyway, these, the spongy moth defoliates about 700,000 acres per year in the Northeast. That's an area about the size of a whole state, uh, Rhode Island. That's a small state, but it's still a whole state. So that's a lot of area that gets defoliated. We don't want that to happen here. And areas with, uh, and actually this, this is one of the biggest things, is the areas with breeding spongy moth populations get put under quarantine. And that means not only do you have the spongy moth to deal with, but also if you're in the lumber industry, now you have to take certain steps to prove that your lumber that you're trying to export doesn't have spongy moth eggs on it and so forth so that it's safe to export and this is extra steps you're gonna have to hire extra people spend more time doing this fill out paperwork um, so we really don't want that to happen in uh, eastern Kentucky and other parts of Kentucky where lumber is a big part of our industry and in fact the lumber industry is a big deal in Kentucky so around 37,000 Kentuckys are, import, are, are employed directly by the lumber industry so that doesn't include people who like uh, uh, work at a restaurant close to a, a lumber mill where everybody goes to eat that day. Um, this is just people directly employed by the lumber industry 
and that payroll adds up to about $800 million. So that's a lot of, uh, a big part of our economy, a big part of our workforce dealing, uh, working directly for the lumber industry. The annual value of timber related products sold directly by the Kentucky uh, timber industry, $6 billion. So that's a big part of our economy. And as we'll see in the next slide, oak is a big part of the timber industry. Um, all those dots down there on that map that shows um, uh, timber facilities, either places that are directly dealing with, with raw logs that come in or that um, are, are producing things directly from those logs. So we have a lot of individual little businesses that very much depend on the timber industry and oak is a big part of that. So that's what this map shows. Um, what this is showing is in this, this sort of mid uh, north central part of the, the United States, we've got um, all these different states and it shows what kind of forest they have. Um, so different types of trees dominate in different parts of the United States. I guess the white areas are here are, is the corn forest. I, I suppose that what, that's the forest type that, that dominates in places like Iowa and Northern Indiana because they don't have a marking on here. But you'll see that ours the, really heavily over here in the eastern part of the state and other parts of our state is this oak, hickory, pine. And really it's a lot of oak. We have a lot of oak trees in Kentucky. They're considered our dominant species. And, um, and we don't want uh, these trees to be um, defoliated constantly over and over year after year by spongy moth. So here's the spongy moth life cycle. One of the things we'll talk about a lot in these modules for Kentucky Keepers is life cycles. Um, th this is important for a couple of reasons. For one thing, we want you to see what all the different parts of the life stages look like so that if you see one of these, you can um, recognize it. Also, it's important to understand their life cycle in terms of time. Like if it's winter, which part of the life cycle might you see? If it's June, which part of the life cycle might you see? But also, just from an educational standpoint, um, 4-H, uh, a lot of 4-H happens around the fourth grade area, and life cycles is a content point in um, next generation science standards right around third, fourth, fifth grade. So it's, it's a really good opportunity to study life cycles. And so we'll talk about life cycles a lot, but here's the spongy moth life cycle. So we'll start up at the top with the male and the female. As you can see again, uh, the male's a little smaller than the female. The female actually doesn't fly. They're a little too big and lumpy um, to fly. So when they come out of their cocoon, they just kind of crawl around, find the places where they want to lay eggs, and the males fly to them. You can also see the males have those uh, exaggerated antenna and these antenna up here that are larger than the females. This is for them to help find the female who's putting out pheromones. Uh, and that's sort of how our trapping works, as we'll talk about in a little bit, is males think they're finding a female, but we're tricking them. And so the male and the female are around. They um, uh, mate. The female lays these eggs that she covers in a spongy substance that helps to protect them. So very few predators will like to eat them. After a while, those eggs hatch. Um, they, they start out as very small caterpillars. But as the caterpillars grow, they get to be a little over an inch long. They have these markings on them. They have a lot of hairs all over their bodies that helps to protect them. Those caterpillars feed for a long time um, through, the, uh, through the season. Then they make a cocoon stage. And then once again, uh, the adults come out of there. So that's what their life cycle looks like. And that's what the different stages look like. Now, what are some things that local, state, and federal agencies are trying to do to prevent a spongy moth uh, or to combat and deal with spongy moth. And uh, in our other presentation, we talked about the, the four main strategies of dealing with invasive species prevention, monitoring, education, and control. So with prevention, um, a quarantine is a big part of this. So there's a federal quarantine on these creatures. Not all invasive species have a federal quarantine. Some just do it state by state, but this is actually a federal quarantine. Uh, this means in order for, um, for one state, a state that's quarantined to ship certain products out of their state to another state, they have to take certain steps, make sure that their, um, their uh, equipment, their construction equipment, their trucking equipment, um, the lumber that they're sending is not contaminated with, with spongy moth. Also, as you'll see that, that, that little poster there, it's not a poster, it's, uh, it's, a, um, it's just a slide from a website. Um, if you move from an area 
that has spongy moth to an area that doesn't, legally you're supposed to inspect all of your stuff. A lot of citizens don't even know about this, but they're, they're actually breaking the law if you don't inspect your um, your moving equipment and so forth as you move from one part of the country to another because these spongy moth egg cases can be laid on just about anything in a wheel well of a car, on the side of a trailer, um, on a, on a uh, charcoal grill outside. They can be laid on all kinds of places. So you're supposed to inspect stuff when you move it out of a quarantine zone to a new area. So that's part of prevention is quarantines and um, inspections of shipments. For monitoring of spongy moth, we have once again our report of pest um, uh, email that we that we'll show you again later. Uh, but, that, but that's a way for the public if they see parts of the spongy moth life, life cycle to report it to report it. And then we also have these federal and state trapping grids. This means that actually members of our department, the Department of Entomology, go out every year and um, this uh, computer tells them where to put these traps and they put out hundreds of these traps all over mostly the eastern part of the state and these are uh, these are traps designed to catch male spongy moths to show us where those males are and if their numbers are building up so that's something that the federal and state does that's something that happens at the federal and state level but also kentucky keepers helps with that too so we're a part of the monitoring system as we put up those uh, traps as well um, in places where the grid doesn't exist to see if the um, spongy moths might be showing up in unexpected places, which is, as we mentioned before, which is something that we found last year. We found spongy moth in places where we weren't expecting it. From the education point of view, um, we want to teach people what spongy moth looks like. We want to let people know how devastating the spongy moth can be to the timber industry, because if people understand how bad it is, they'll want to help stop it. And of course, we train um, people in the industry and just general awareness about this, this creature is very important. And then control. Um, uh, so every once in a while, a small spongy moth population has gotten started in Kentucky and started breeding. And whenever we find that, usually from trapping, we can go in with insecticides and wipe that out. That's happened a couple of times. Um, sometimes the insecticides, by the way, are based on viruses that infect the insect that doesn't infect anything else. So it's kind of a... Uh, not quite as bad for the environment as some kinds of uh, pesticides are. And sometimes it's done with aerial pesticides, in other words, spread by airplanes, spread by airplanes. Um, and then um, once that happens, then that surrounding area is as a little more, it's a little more heavy duty inspection and monitoring to make sure that we, they didn't miss anything. Um, so those are, the, those are some of the steps that we do to try to slow the spread of these things. And now how can the Kentucky keepers help with this? And this is pretty much the same thing we'll say in all these modules. The, the first thing you can do to help is to learn about it yourself, whether you're a 4-H agent, uh, and, and, uh, a 4-H assistant, other 4-H or extension staff, or a volunteer. The, if you learn about the invasive species, learn about its life cycle, learn what it eats, what it does, why it's a problem, just you knowing that is a, is a big part of it. But then the next step, obviously, is to, is to educate others. Um, you can educate 4-H'ers, 4-H'ers can educate other kids. We encourage 4-H'ers to include, include spongy moth in some kind of a book report or, or class project, um, and then tell people about the report of pest at uky.edu um, email, where people, if they suspect one of these creatures, they can take a picture of it, send it, uh, it's a digital picture, attach it to an email and send that, and then we'll, we'll take a look at that email and see if it requires further action. And then the next step that you can do is um, if you want to get involved with the monitoring process, which is one of the things that Kentucky Keepers is trying to promote. And so that's what kind of the rest of this presentation is about. If you want to help with the monitoring program, here are some things that you would need to do. And watching this um, presentation is a big part of what you need to do. But here's a little bit about sort of the history of spongy moth monitoring in general. So it's called slow the spread. That's, that's kind of the official slogan for the multi-state and federal uh, spongy moth monitoring program. It's been going on for many years now, since 1992. Uh, and our department's been involved in this a long time as well. We've been trying to educate people, trapping moths, monitoring, eradicating small populations of spongy moths when they get, uh, when they get found and also quarantining um, the states where uh, the spongy moth is established. Now in Kentucky, we mentioned this before, but Kentucky doesn't have breeding populations of spongy moth as far as we know. But 
individual males can fly a long way. And uh, so females can't fly, right? So the, but the males can fly. So they, they tend to wander out. And we do have those males wander into our territory from time to time. And we, will, we trap those in these traps that are put up both by Kentucky keepers and by the state. They, they, they are usually trapped in the eastern part of the state because we presume they're coming to us from places like West Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania. But we're really not sure. There could also possibly be, who knows, some uh, population that's in extreme eastern Kentucky somewhere that we don't know about yet. Um, and the more that we can pinpoint where these males are, uh, and if we see them in the same place over and over again, or if we see a whole bunch of them in one area in the traps, that would let us know that we need to zero in. But so far in Kentucky, we just find males here and there. So in the past, this monitoring has, has only been done by state agencies and our department, but Kentucky Keepers are a part of this too now since last year. So your job as a Kentucky Keeper, if you choose to, to uh, participate in the monitoring program, is basically to increase the number of traps that are out there. So our department puts a certain number out there, but we want even more. We don't have enough funding to put it out there, so we need volunteers. Uh, we want more traps out there so we have a better chance of finding spongy moth um, when and if breeding populations show up. And you can also, uh, of course, educate people about the moth and invasive species in general. And last year, uh, Kentucky Keepers was extremely beneficial. They found a handful of spongy moth in places where we didn't put the grid up. We didn't think that we would find spongy moths there, like Taylor County. And uh, we also found some um, spongy moths a little later in the year than, than we would expect. The moths tend to fly a little earlier in the summer, kind of June, mid-summer, July, but we were finding them in some of these traps in late July, which was surprising uh, that we were not quite sure what's happening there, uh, but that was new information. And so um, that was valuable because uh, we bring in our, the, the traps that our department puts in, we bring them in fairly early in the summer. But some of the sponge, some of the, the ones that Kentucky Keepers set up, they let stay out a little longer, which is fine. Uh, but they caught moths a little later than we, we expected. So that was very valuable information. So you guys are actually helping us do real stuff. So here's a little bit more of a, um, of a modern map. I believe this one goes up to 2018 or so. And this shows um, a little bit more about where spongy moth has, has spread to. It's kind of been a holding in terms of breeding populations um, uh, still a little east of Kentucky. So these are sort of the hot zones here, the blue and the pink. And then when you get into the yellow, which is where Kentucky is, this is where we occasionally find male moths, but we don't expect that we have breeding populations going here in Kentucky. But that num those, those populations could creep closer to us at any time. We're just not quite sure when that might happen uh, over here in West Virginia, Virginia. You see it's getting very close to Pike County there um, in this area right here. So that's why we concentrate our grid in that area. But as you see with these with these yellow markings, uh, these, these yellow counties, sometimes moths are found over here too. And we don't have as much money in our, in our trapping system, trapping funds to put out a grid out here. So when Kentucky keepers put out um, traps in these areas, we're more likely to catch some. And look, and even way out here, look, we don't, uh, don't, don't catch many very out here, out here very often, but we, Illinois does. So what if there's some, some out here that are being missed? So the more traps Kentucky keepers can set up, the better. This just shows how um, sometimes more moths are trapped in Kentucky than others. So sometimes we catch quite a few, um, 506 in this one year, but it's generally usually in kind of the few dozen uh, kind of number and you know these are these are male moths they're isolated we are uh, presuming in most cases that these are just males drifting over to our state from one of the states where they actually have breeding populations of females um, but we have had some infestations um, a few times where we've actually had breeding populations get in here and we've had to go eradicate them so um, and the, uh, the happened in 85, 94, again in 94, and in 2007. So by trapping, we knew that there were more moths than we would expect, so we went in, uh, found the populations, uh, wiped them out with um, pesticides, and as far as we know, those populations were eradicated. So, so this is good news. This means that if we find it, 
we can we can stop these things, but we have to find them while there's while there's just a small population because if it gets too big, um, there's just no amount of pesticide, no amount of eradication that could totally get rid of them. So how does trapping work? We're going to try to show you um, how to put these traps up. There's actually some videos that we're going to put links to that show you how the traps um, go up. But the trap looks like this. It's orange. It's kind of a triangular shape. It's made out of paper. It's extremely lightweight. Um, it's ab about about this big, about the size of maybe a small shoe, and it's either stapled or zip tied to to trees. We're going to send you zip ties um, to put them up, and it works by having a a lure inside. It. For one thing, the whole inside of it is sticky, like sticky glue, and it's got a lure inside of it that mimics the way the female pheromone smells for the spongy moth and it attracts any male spongy moths in the area to the trap. They get trapped in there. And then um, the, the, the trap gets taken off, sent to our department, and we screen them to see if we think there's any spongy moths. If we think there's a spongy moth, we send it on even further to an expert that really knows spongy moth, because spongy moth looks like basically just any other moth, so it's kind of hard to identify. But uh, we send it to somebody who really knows spongy moth, and they confirm whether we found it or not. Um, it's important to mention, I'll mention this again, but the, the, the traps are not intended to reduce the population of, of spongy moth. They don't really help with that. It's, uh, we're assuming we're only catching some, pop, some portion of the males. Um, the idea is just to get um, a sense of where the males are, how far into Kentucky they're getting. If we catch a whole bunch of males in one area, that would tell us maybe there's more likely to be a, a breeding population there or that our breeding population is getting closer to Kentucky's borders. So the first thing you need to do if you want to do, get involved with spongy moth trapping, um, in addition to telling us that you want to do it, and you need to basically tell us that uh, sometime before um, June so we can send you the traps. But the next thing you do is download the ArcGIS Survey 123 app. It's just a free GPS surveying app that's used for all kinds of different things. Um, you download it onto your phone and you will need um, a login, which if you're not sure what your login is, if your county isn't listed here, ask us. But in most cases, it will just be your county name followed by CES for Cooperative Extension, an underscore, and then OSE, and then everybody has the same password, which is OSE Survey 1. So that's how you log into the thing. And now for the, uh, the trapping itself. So um, when we give you these traps, the idea is for you and your 4-Hers to just go out there and put them somewhere. They can be put almost anywhere. Um, the more kind of unusual places you put them, the better. Our, um, our trapping grid kind of tells us where to put them, the ones that we do for our department. So for you guys, uh, the unusual places like um, in the middle of a city or um, in somebody's yard is good. They don't have to be on a tree. They can be on um, a bird feeder or something. They can be in all kinds of different places, um, the side of a house. Um, so the traps are placed almost anywhere, usually on a tree because it's easy to get to a tree. And we, we want them to be um, about face height or so because the moths fly a little bit up. Um, but what we, what we are encouraging you to do is if you're doing this with 4-H's, do this in a fun place. To get, have an excuse to take a hike somewhere. Um, do it in a local park. Uh, make a scavenger hunt out of it because because these things can be can be put almost anywhere so uh, challenge your 4-H's to put them someplace unique someplace fun just make sure you have permission um, wherever you are to put it um, these are designed to attract and capture male spongy moths not really to kill a lot of moths the point of the traps is just to know where moths are the traps have to be put out and uh, tied up and ready to go before June 5th, 15th they need to, to be, you can put them up before that if you want to, but they need to be up by June 15th. And then when you put them up, you go into the little um, Survey123 app, you enter some information about who you are, what the date is, um, your login, and then um, the app tells you the GPS location. It, it does that automatically. It also does the date automatically. Then you just submit it and it's ready to go. Then um, you you need you will go back later to get that trap so you might mentally need to remember where you put it um, write it maybe write it down in a log book or something like that but it's also recorded on a, on a map so you can um, look at that map later if you need to as well your county will we were going we are going to send you 10 traps uh 
but we will send you more than that if you want. You just need to ask us. So 10 traps that can be put, like I said, almost anywhere. Some other ideas here, um, state parks. So our, we've talked to some of the, the leadership at Kentucky State Parks. And um, they, so th this would include like state resort parks like um, uh, Natural Bridge, places like that, places with hiking trails, uh, about putting some of our traps in those places. And they're all for it. We, If you want to do this, either contact them directly or we can put you in, in contact with the right with the right people. And you let them know that you're going there first and let them know where you're going to put them on the trail. Uh, they might even want to do something like put up some signs telling the public why these traps are here so that people aren't confused or think it's litter or something like that. But state parks would be a really good place to do, to do this. And also it would be a really good idea like if let's say if you put all 10 of your traps into one of our state parks on the trails back in there. It'd be really cool uh, to on a summer night a lot of these state parks they actually have a really busy, like fun atmosphere in the campground on Friday nights or Saturday nights. People, there'll be DJs there and stuff or live bands at our state parks. Um, people are cooking and stuff. It would be really cool to do a presentation there. So a bunch of 4-H'ers show up um, and tell people about invasive species and why they're so important. And, and that can have a really big impact. Young people in the middle of a uh, state forest campground in the middle of the trees that are in jeopardy and explaining to people what the Kentucky Keepers program is all about. You could hand out pamphlets and stuff like that. So um, we encourage you to, to you know, expand this, this project into something that's useful for you or something that is maybe is a, a, an interesting experience. So actually getting the trap ready, you'll need to do a couple of things kind of before you leave the house. Uh, and we've got a whole video uh, on this. So the link down at the bottom is the prepping your trap video. You really need to watch that whole video. But these are the basic steps. So the materials that you need are the, the traps that we send you. We're gonna to try to send them to you sometime in the month of May. And then you will you will get those. Um, the traps will have the lures are separate. The lures are, they look like a black string. You will also need a stapler, a Sharpie, some zip ties, stickers to put a, a little uh, label on the bottom of the trap showing um, where the trap is and, and the, the, um, the, the number of the trap. Also some data sheets and you'll also need your cell phone with you when you actually go out to set the trap. So the first thing you do, you, and once again, you really need to watch the video to see how this is done because you, um, you start with the trap still flattened and then you staple the lure to the trap then you fold the trap up almost like a little tent into a little triangular shape. You put a sticker on the bottom that we give you. We give you these stickers and there's a place on there for you to write your county code. And um, your county code is a code that is, um, I guess, assigned by the state of Kentucky. Each, or maybe it's a federal designation, but each county has its own county code. And you can find those county codes. Just, it's just a three digit uh, number. And this link right down here shows your county and what the county code is. Fayette County's county code, for instance, is 067. Um, so what you do, you write down your county code and the number of the trap on the sticker. We're asking everybody to start your trap at number 1000. So the first trap you would hang up would be number 1000, the second one 1001 and up to 1010, or if you have more traps than that, it would go up higher than that. Um, try to try to coordinate with the members of your team so you don't actually accidentally put the, the two two traps that are both 067-1001. Try to coordinate beforehand and maybe number the traps beforehand so that nobody puts the, the same number twice. I actually don't think it'll be that much of a problem if you put the same number twice. It just helps us to, to keep them sorted as to which one goes where. So that's what that's what goes into the trap itself. And then please, once again, watch this video down here, right down here, uh, that, that shows actually Carl, who's our invasive species spongy moth expert, actually building one of these traps. It just takes a few seconds to do it, but you just want to make sure to do it right. And also do it without getting a bunch of sticky gunk all over you. The next step is hanging the trap. We have a separate video that Carl has done showing how to hang the trap. Uh, the idea is to find a tree. You can also use, like I said, side of a building, a flagpole. There's all kinds of different places you can put these. But you want something with a with a something coming out 
horizontally that you can hang it off of. And we want to try to spread these things out a little bit. So it would be okay, like I said, to put all 10 of your traps within the same park or something, but try to keep them around 100 yards apart from the last trap. This is just to make the trapping more efficient. Uh, and the, the further apart you can spread them, the better. So the more coverage we have, the better. But really, honestly, anywhere you put them is good. Um, and then also, it's usually good unless you are specifically working with something like a state park where they're going to put up signs and tell people why the traps are there. It's usually a good idea to get the trap a little ways off the trail because what sometimes happens is people walk by on the trail and either they are a good citizen and they think that this is garbage and they just try to rip it down and throw it away or they are a mischievous teenager and they uh, uh, throw a, um, a bag of Doritos inside the trap or something which kind of ruins the trap. So it's, it's, good, it's good especially if you're in a place that um, is a more anonymous trail or something like that to go back into the trees a little bit although uh, write it down so you remember kind of where you went. Uh, and uh, facing like picking a tree maybe that's on the trail but a branch facing away from the trail something like that. We want you to zip tie the trap. You'll see the trap has a little eye in it with a little hole that you can slip a zip tie through. We're gonna zip, we're gonna give you zip ties and zip tie it to a branch at about your face height. So that's that's approximate. So if you're if you're like me and your face is a little bit shorter, that's okay, or if you're a little bit taller, it's just an approximation. But we don't what we don't want it is down low on the ground because down low on the ground there's weeds in the way and moths just don't fly through there. They fly through open sort of space. Uh, so do it at about face height, but don't put up put it up higher than that either. They're, they're, it's going to be around human face level is where we're going to catch the most. Uh, then so then you uh, log into the app, the our, this survey one two three app. And now that you've hung your trap, you will write down the important info. You will put down in the app the important information for that specific trap you just put which, like I said, you'll put your name, you'll put your county, it'll automatically find the GPS and the date for you, but you will write down the trap number, which once again would be your county code plus 1000 and whatever, 1001, 1002. Click uh, submit, and then you've submitted your trap data, and then you walk away and leave it there for a couple months. Uh, this video right here shows Carl actually hanging a trap to show how it's done properly so please watch that video it's a pretty short video all right so now that you've placed your trap the next step is just kind of to let it cook out there let it see if it will attract some male spongy moths so you leave the trap up uh, from when you placed it which was hopefully before june 15th and let it sit until after july 31st uh, now, after July 31st, you can actually have a long window of when you can bring it back to us um, or send it back to us, but we ask that you bring it in before September 1st, if possible. So it's a pretty, pretty long window there. But um, optionally, somewhere in between June 15th and July 31st, you can go and check the trap anytime in between if this maybe would be a good project or a good excuse to go on another hike with your 4-H club. Go check it, and if you look, peek inside, if you see something that looks like um, it could be spongy moth, you can actually take a picture of it and put it in the app and send it to us. And there's actually a little option in the app for checking the trap as opposed to either setting or taking down the trap. And that will be very interesting to us if you, if you send us that. So that's optional, but if you'd like to do that, checking the trap in between would be very helpful. So like I said, we want you to bring in the traps sometime after July 31st and try to bring them in before September 1st. Um, there's no real hard deadline on when we want them back. It's just that it takes a long time to go through all of them, all of them and to send them on to uh, the federal authorities. So um, we want them back um, kind of in the early fall area if we can. Now, when you actually take the trap off of the tree, um, uh, you, can, you can open it to look and see if there's spongy moths there. Uh, and you can take pictures if you want uh, when you've taken the trap off. But try to keep it basically in a, in a triangular shape because if it's folded back together, all the sticky stuff gets stuck together and then peeling it apart is, is a big mess. It's like gluing two pieces of paper together and trying to peel them back apart. So try to keep it roughly into that triangular shape. And then when you send it back to us, 
usually the best way is to send them kind of loose in a box, uh, uh, still kind of in their tent shape, kind of loosely in a box is usually a good way to do it. So that's how we want you to send them back to us. And if there are questions about how to send them back or when to send them back and all that stuff, just please ask us. The most important thing is getting them out there in the first place. Now, once you've hung your trap and entered the information on the ArcGIS app, your trap actually goes live onto our website, which you can look at at any time. So um, that's, the, that's the, um, that, the web address for it down here, right down here, and it looks something like this. You actually have to scroll down the page a little bit to get to the map, but as new traps are added each year, they show up on the map, and you can zoom in and you can find them. And if, even, if you find your exact trap, it'll show the name of the person who, um, who put that trap up and so forth. So for one thing, it's kind of cool to see your work as it happens, um, but also if you can't remember where you found your trap, this is, might be a way to help locate it again. But please write down somewhere where you put your traps so that you can remember. A really good way to do it would be right after you entered it into, um, or while you're entering it into the app, there's a place down at the bottom that says notes. Um, write down kind of where you are, say, oh, I'm on uh, the Red River Gorge, so-and-so arch trail, and I'm in, I, I walked in about a mile or so, and it's on the right side of the, of the trail. So someplace where you can find it, and then maybe also write it down in your cell phone somewhere. Um, uh, to, to remind yourself how to find that trap again. It's not the end of the world if we can't find them all. It's just we've lost that um, we've lost that work that you've done if we can't find the trap again. So once again, if you have questions about spongy moth biology, about why it's important, about how to use the Survey One Two Three app, how to deal with the traps, um, uh, if if it's um, if it's not 2023 anymore and you're interested in participating in the Spongy Moth program and you want to talk to us about maybe 2024, ask us. So ask me or ask uh, Carl Harper right down there and we'll probably see you in another one of these presentations.